Well, as I mentioned, uh, the name is Eric Emanuel, and I'm the CEO and Executive Director of the Institute for Local Government. Um, ILG, as Brent mentioned, is the nonprofit training and education affiliate of the League, CSAC, and the Special Districts Association. And together, with all three of those parent organizations, we represent about 5,000 local agencies across the state. And our main pillars of work are really centered on four key areas. Leadership and governance, sustainable communities, public engagement, youth and civics education. And what that means is that we provide all of those program areas as like our main focus areas, but then we also offer a range of service areas uh, in, those in those areas to help. And uh, ILG's been around for about 65 years. And that means that we've been working for about 65 years successfully with local agencies and local leaders on whatever programs and services they really need. And because we've been working so closely with counties and cities and special districts for so long, we have a pretty good understanding of local government. And we see, and I personally see, even in the five months that I've been working here, how much is on the plate of local government leaders. How much you're being asked to do, how much more you're being asked to do, and, and at what level. And one of the things that ILG tries to do is stay on top of the latest state policy that, implement, that impacts local agencies and how you're implementing. So our mission is to help translate between state, local, and community organizations and issues. We provide impartial and easy to use resources that really help local governments meet their goals. And we wanna help counties really build capacity, get the technical assistance that you need to do work on the ground, secure funding if you need it so that you have the resources that you need. And last, we wanna tell your story. We actually exist, and, and I think it started as an organization that really was about promoting good government at the local level. And good government is happening all over the state. And a lot of times that's not talked about, and it's something that ILG really wants to focus on. The last thing, though, is that we want to help you navigate the challenges you have in implementing policy, but we also want to make sure you're taking advantage of opportunities and capitalizing those as well. And that's really why we're here today. I kind of bugged Graham about opportunity zones, and I thought, you know, this is a really interesting topic. It's really important for counties to know what's happening with this program, so that if you can take advantage of it, then you do. So the Opportunity Zone tax benefit was passed by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in December of 2017. It provides federal tax incentives for long-term capital investments in low-income communities throughout the U.S. And this is a really sizable tax benefit. And that's already motivating investors and developers to start looking for opportunities for investments in these economically distressed areas all over the country. They are estimating that over $100 billion will be invested in opportunities across the nation, and that number can grow. And because this tax credit offers the most substantial benefits to those that uh, invest early in the cycle, so that's 2019 through 2025, a lot of that investment is going to happen really, really soon. So you might be wondering, why is ILG moderating a panel on Opportunity Zones? Uh, for starters, the sex a parent organization, and we want to do everything that we can to support our parent organizations and your members, so counties are a huge focus area for us. But more than that, we are really here to help you navigate complex issues with information and resources. And this isn't a specialty area for ILG, but it's an important issue to you, and we want you to know how you can take advantage. And the third reason is a personal one. I'm from the Central Valley. I went to high school in a tiny town in Stanislaus County. And so I know how important economic development is to this region, and how sometimes the Central Valley doesn't get the attention that it deserves, and that you all are working really, really hard, and this is a great opportunity to connect the dots between development that you've been wanting with the projects that you want to get done. The other thing is that we have heard that many local leaders have a lot of confusion about opportunity zones. There's uncertainty about the size and scope, the investment, and the role specifically that counties need to play in this process. Because if you think about it, and I think someone mentioned, cities might be doing some work, but is a county involved? How are you connecting the dots, right? And what are the time frames? Are you too late? Are you too early? Um, do you have the resources to even do this? And then the big issue is this. Um, I lived here, I know, my family still lives here. Um, I'm gonna get in trouble if I don't swim by and see my mom on the way back to Sacramento. Um, the key here is that um, the Central Valley is unique and it is special, and you deserve to think about the planning for the Central Valley a little bit differently than you would plan for LA or San Francisco or some other town, um, particularly when you consider the differences between rural and urban. 
And so um, you have to think about the, the pros and cons and that delicate balance between inviting in new investment and then understanding how that syncs up with the goals of the growth for your region and how that authentic mix stays authentic. So the goal of this session is really to demystify opportunity zones and give you some guidance about the timing and the next steps you can take to make sure that you can take advantage of this tool if you can. This legislation is really about not leaving people behind. And in many ways, this describes the Central Valley. So the ins and outs are really complicated. They're still figuring out some of the logistics and some of the, the, the regulations. But we do know enough. And before we get started with the session, just so our panelists can get a sense of how much is, uh, awareness is in the room, why don't we do a show of hands really quickly? How many of you already know a lot about Opportunity Zones? Hands up. Don't be shy, it's OK. All right, how many of you know just enough to be dangerous? OK, that's good. And how many of you know very little, like nothing at all? And that's OK, too. That's great. We're going to cover a lot of things. We understand there's a wide range of knowledge. And this is not a surprise. Um, this is a really complex idea. And we're going to start with the big six. So these slides are pretty small, some of the text is. What I will tell you is that the CSAC team will share uh, these, the whole entire presentation electronically if you want to download it so you don't have to take too many notes. Just hopefully you'll be able to see um, some slides better than others. So the legislation created the incentive and the designation in 2017. And these opportunity zones, or OZs, are distressed census tracts. And they meet certain eligibility requirements, and specifically those related to income. There are about 8,700 zones across the country, and California alone has about 10% of them. So investors are going to get tax benefits for placing unrealized capital gains into opportunity funds. And unlike other programs, there are really no monetary caps on the investment, so it's both flexible and it's scalable. So corporations and individuals can defer capital gains until 2026, and if they invest for at least 10 years, uh, the gain's not taxable. So a lot of cities have already begun to think about the power of these opportunity zones and their convening task forces and their aligning priorities. So another quick poll, by a show of hands, how many of you have been invited to participate in conversations with cities about opportunity zones in your county? Very few. How many of you have initiated discussions or convening groups on your own? A few, great. So that's helpful, so as we kind of work through this presentation, we'll talk through some of those details. So we have the potential to make a huge impact in the Central Valley. Some people are calling this the most ta powerful tax provision and asset diversion tool available in decades. So if we do this well, and I say we because I feel like this is, I'm a member of this community, we can really help spur development, we can expand job creation, and we might be able to increase the economic mobility of this community. So these are the goals of our session. We want you to understand opportunity zones. We want you to understand your role, because counties can play a role. Have some strategies to maximize impact and then learn how to position your community for investment. Um, and if you decide to do that, how you move forward. We're going to talk about some complex topics, but like I said, this presentation will be available to you. And we're going to simplify this a bit so that if you're not uh, a tax accountant or an economic developer, that you're still going to get it, right? So don't worry about that. And if you have questions, we'll have opportunities to talk through that in the end. This is how we're going to structure the panel. So we're going to do some panel introductions. Then I'm going to talk about the basics and county's role. Then we'll go into how to really attract investors by differentiating your county and creating value. Then we're going to talk about leveraging opportunity zones to maximize economic and social impact. And then we'll close it out with the Q&A and then some closing remarks. I have a phenomenal panel of experts here, and I'm excited to share the dice with them. Um, let me uh, start with introducing our panelists. So our first panelist is Larry Cosmont. This is Larry. Larry's the chairman and CEO of Cosmont Companies, which he founded in 1986. Larry's 40-year career that is, includes public-private financial structuring, negotiation, development, and management of real estate and public finance transactions. He's helped hundreds of local government agencies with public finance and real estate projects, and he's helped over a thousand private sector projects get public approvals, structured deal terms, and secure financing. Larry also has a background as a local government leader in both city management and redevelopment. Um, please welcome Larry Cosmo. Next is Will Oliver. Will is the Director of Business Services for the Fresno County uh, Economic Development Corporation, where he leads a team that is committed to providing advocacy, outreach, and support services to area businesses to foster job retention and business expansion. Will is also a third-generation Madarin, and he in the community for over 100 years. 
He also served on the Madera City Council, so please welcome Will Oliver. And last but not least, we have Matt Horton. Matt is the Associate Director of the Milken Institute Center for Regional Economics and the California Center. So Matt worked at, his work at Milliken is focused on identifying a variety of financial tools, policies, and collaborative models that leaders can use to increase investments to education, community development, and other areas that are really supporting human capital. Prior to working at Milliken, Matt worked for uh, SCAG, where he developed plans to address growth, resiliency, and improve quality of life, which is really a lot of what we're talking about today. So thank you for being here, Matt. But who's not on this panel today specifically, just so that you know, is a tax accountant and a developer. Um, and that's a disclaimer for you because as part of this process, the other thing you might need to know is some of the specifics related to development, commercial development in particular, and then the financing and tax incentive options of the program. Now we do have experts here that might be able to speak to some of those things, but every region is different, every community is different, and you're gonna probably need some advice in that regard as well. So we're going to kick off our session today with Larry Cosma. He's going to talk about Opportunity Zone Basics and how to use OZs as part of a comprehensive OZ strategy. So thank you, Erica. Uh, glad to be here. We uh, at Cosma, we've been in business uh, since 1986. Before that, I was a city manager in a number of different cities throughout the state. And uh, we have over 60, 70 county and city clients throughout California and the Western United States. We really focus on three things, economic development, public finance, and real estate. This program that we'll talk about today, it's a little bit complicated, but it's also very unique. And I think it strikes at the heart, buddy, what you were saying, that this is a program that the private sector can leverage to its benefit and the concurrent benefit is that the communities that have these opportunity zones can get timed early and significant investments that are not driven directly by incentives provided by us at the county or city level, but they're motivated and driven by a federal tax package that is probably the most expansive investment package I've ever seen. I've been in this business 40 years doing public-private transactions and have a public finance and a private finance background, and I've never quite seen anything like this, and I'll show it to you. It's a bit complicated because it's tax driven. It's a bit different because the motives of the investors are tax and yield. Tax prevention, tax reduction, tax minimization, and project yield. The interesting thing is that it starts from a point of working in community areas that have been underinvested, and that's where the nexus is. We get to attract through a federal codification program, federal, ta federal tax program, private money that would not necessarily look at the census tracts that were included in the OZ. So I wanted to frame the discussion of a bunch of slides. I'll start to move quickly. Another element of this is that California is incredibly invested in opportunity zones. Now, so interesting to see, I think, a pretty minimal show of hands on most levels to Erica's questions. I think it's just early. I think local government, counties and cities, are just waking up to the advent and the potential of opportunity zones. I think the governor and the legislature are, being, are convincing themselves that if they can manage this flow of incredible capital source to California, there'd be a great benefit. And the governor in particular said, we think that if you combine opportunity zones and enhanced infrastructure financing districts, that's a good recipe. I'll talk about that in a while. And I, I agree with it, by the way. So uh, Erica covered this, I wanna move through that. 879 opportunity zones in California. There, in my view, we're 11% of the marketplace. So that's the good news. Here's the bad news. California's a hard place to invest in and we're in competition with 49 other states because they all have opportunity zones. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. The key is that these were census tracts that were approved in, as part of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. This is a law that came out of the Trump tax bill at the end of 2017, December 22nd. And the tracts that were approved went through a state process, essentially out of the governor's office. So our 879 were basically ratified in April 2018. They can't be changed unless there is a significant modification to the OZ law. This is a 10-year program it has a start gun on January 1, 2018. That's interesting for us because so many of uh, the local government economic development leaders that are considering ways to get private investment often have to induce this interest. 
Here, the bell got started because some CPA called someone with a big capital gain and said, dude, you better get going. If you want to take advantage of this, you need to get invested by the end of 2019. So there is, again, a private momentum that occurs. The key for us on the government side is to figure out how we can direct it. Because we can't really manage it. We can influence it, influence it a bit. But the most important thing is we can attract it. So what are the benefits? There's basically three benefits that go on with this program. One is the incentivization of tax yield investors who have sold a company, sold stock, sold real estate after 2017 that have a capital gain and are willing to invest it in a qualified opportunity fund. You can't just go, let's say, to Buddy and say, I'd like to put a million dollars in Fresno County. You have to put it in a qualified opportunity fund which gets registered with the IRS. And then that fund turns around and looks for opportunities in these 879 California tracks. So that's the first step. Second step is timing is critical because the way the program is structured, I'll show you that in the next slide, is that for the tax yield investor to shield their gains and maximize their returns under the tax code, you have to start early, not wait. And that's why it's an imperative for us locally. And the interesting thing is that there will be competition, but despite the competition, the upside for us is that we can include opportunity zones as part of an economic development strategy for housing, for jobs, for business development, for property development. And we can combine it with other local government incentive programs. How does it work? Let's say, I'll pick on Buddy again. Buddy and I sell a business, $2 million. We have a capital gain. God bless us, we were smart. Um, that's all we got? That's all we got. <laughs> so, two million, if we can buy, we, we take that gain post-2017. We essentially have 180 days from the booking of that gain to push it into a qualified opportunity fund, which is a two-page filing form, 8996 form, with the IRS. At that point, the Qualified Opportunity Fund has about 31 months to take it and reinvest it in either a business or a property. Now here's the upside. If we are in the 30 to 40% tax bracket, we will defer that tax payment through December 31, 2026, just by putting the money in a QAF, which we call a Qualified Opportunity Fund. Second benefit, if we do it early enough and we have the money in the cloth for five or seven years, we get a step up in basis, meaning a forgiveness in tax. So had we, were, had we intended to pay 30% of the two million, we've now deferred it, we now have the ability to drop that 30% that 30% bill by 15% or the two million drops in the basis and the tax that we get is essentially, fit, we have to pay on in 2026 is 15% less. So we pay about $350,000 less for tax on that $2 million gain in 2026. But the tax is due in 2026. So here's the big thumper. If we keep that investment for 10 years, we, any gain attributable to that $2 million in the 10 years is entirely tax-free from capital gains. So what does this mean? Early investment, deferral of tax, early forgiveness, and full forgiveness for a 10-year hold. The good news for us in the economic development world is that these are not in and out investors. They have to be in for 10 years to take advantage of it. And this is sort of the golden, the golden road. You basically start in 2009, you keep it in in five or seven years, your base is an increase, so you pay a little bit less tax. You pay the tax on 2026, but you keep it till 2029, and all the appreciation, saying you make money, that's the key, saying you make money, it's tax exempt, free from tax. Now, what can you do with this? Now, here's the upside for us. The tax is often related or sometimes compared to a 1031 exchange. Many of us know that exchange in real estate. It's different. A 1031 exchange is a lifetime rollover. You can continue to roll it over but you have to do it with like-kind property, and it relates to real estate. This is any capital gain from any kind of upside that you would have 
achieved in a prior investment and can be rolled over into any kind of investment, whether it's a business or a real estate property. So you have a development potential where you buy a property, and if you do, within 30 months, you have to improve the buildings that you buy by at least an amount equal to the basis you transferred. So we buy a building, two million, and we, the, let's say the land was a million, the land is free from value in this transaction, but the building needs to be improved by another two million within 30 months. That's the real estate play. If you buy a business, you have to invest that two million dollars in 70% equivalent value of tangible property, which could be real estate or business equipment, within a 31 month period. Those are the avenues for these investors to either buy businesses in areas that have been underinvested or buy property and develop it. So it's a development program and it's a business investment program. And the economic upside for local communities is significant. Why? There's a whole bunch of them. There are a lot of counties that have a lot of OZ areas. And the reality is you can do almost anything you want with them. So if you're a tax investor, you're really interested in getting a return. So the point is, is that you have to have projects that are competitive. The tax investor is not interested in taking the gain. By the way, $6.1 trillion in gains sitting on balance sheets in America. Right, so these are all eligible investors. This is not a small amount of money. The number of funds that have been created since January 1, 2018, 144 and increasing every day. 30 billion already collected in those funds. So why is that important to us? Well, because if we can figure out, based on those maps in your counties, how to use this money for rural revitalization, for blighted industrial, for declining commercial corridors, for deteriorating neighborhoods, we're bucks ahead. It's a it's a win-win for us if we can attract these investors block by block to the best opportunities to suggest. Here's the other thing, just like the private market, ozones, no different. Not every investment is created equally. Just because we have a property here doesn't mean it's as investable as a property, let's say, on the north side. It's imperative that if counties or cities want to attract this money and be competitive with other counties that have ozones to find a way to portray the best investment opportunities. Why wouldn't we do that? Because it's really private investment, it's not ours. It's just our real estate in the sense that it's in our community. So we get to leverage those opportunities on the back of the income tax code. Stockton, Bakersfield. So really, at the end of the day, this becomes the opening chapter, in my view, for a fairly compelling economic development approach for a county or a city. You can combine it with an enhanced infrastructure financing district. Why does that make sense? Well, those tax income districts collect tax increment for 45 years. The OZ investor is, wants to be in the ground, up and operating, either in a new business or in real estate or both, within two years to maximize the investment from this code change. So you've got early investment that you don't have to induce necessarily with tax increment, but you can yield the tax increment and put it anywhere in the rest of the, of the census tract or the district and attract additional opportunity zone investment. So you get that rollover or upside effect. You can combine it with federal grants, state grants, and so on. This is the toolkit that we talk to with county supervisors and city managers and councils all the time. We say, look, the state in the last five years since the elimination of redevelopment has created a number of special districts that use tax increment or sales tax increment for counties and cities to garner, and they continue to improve it. They continue to improve it. For example, last year, SB 1145, LABA, allowed tax increment to be used for maintenance. We can never do that under redevelopment. So we have the ability to provide infrastructure through these districts and help attract investment through the Opportunity Zone. It's a very different and a very persuasive and compelling approach. And California recognizes it. So we're trying to, number one, in California, and Matt will talk about this, 
get some conformance between our state code, which is expensive. You know, we charge and we tax high income investors at 13.5% on the upside. Most states have already conformed the forgiveness that I demonstrated to you in their code to the OZ code. We have it, so we're talking about it. We like to talk about those things, we'll see. The governor and his, his budget trailer bill just this week added 500 million for infrastructure in a brand new fund, totally usable with an opportunity zone and it's money that'll be available soon. We have Prop 2 planning money that can be used for the ozone areas. So we have the tools. In addition, we're looking at CEQA streamlining and even in SB5 for EIFDs, the ability to kick back the ERAF the counties send to the state and keep it here in an EIFD, another compliment for an opportunity zone. So I've thrown a lot of the technical at you and I apologize for that, but it's not so easy to really get to understand how to use this program until you know the basics. But you know the basics. It's a tax deferral until 2026. It's a discount on the tax due in 2026. And it's absolutely forgiveness of all profits if you hold it for 10 years. And as a result, if you're interested in attracting that kind of investor and you have a zone, the program that we think you need to go to is really to do some outreach. Something that clearly is needed just by the amount or the lack of knowledge that exists even in this room. We need as leaders to get out to our communities and basically see what the, what the support is for engaging the private sector on turf that got created by the income tax law. That really gives us the ability to attack, attract new money for businesses existing or new that never had a chance to access this kind of capital before. And we ought to review our economic development plans, upgrade our specific plans, and get ready by identifying the best blocks that fit with our policy that are available in these opportunity zones and package them up and take them to the opportunity zone fund marketplace. Because right now, there's 144 funding sources for all of us to talk to that have much different aspects and views on how and where they should invest. And they're easily persuaded by a compelling opportunity in an opportunity zone that's also supported politically. Not out of your pocket. They just want to know that they can close a deal, get it built, and take the tax benefits and count on them. That's something we can control. And to the extent we can, we become competitive. <coughs> And being competitive for California because of CEQA and other entitlement challenges really makes it important for you, the leaders here in this room, county managers, county supervisors, city managers, city council members, to really understand that if they set up that outreach program that I, I basically talked about in the last couple of slides and they convert it to a promotional program and they go talk and seek the best, most compatible investors for their communities, they can actually get something done because you already have the audience. You don't have to convince them. They're already looking. So the question is, can you create a prospectus? Can you tell the story? Can you use collective efforts between cities and counties and EDCs to gather the momentum up? Can you find the right funds? Can you show them that you'll streamline the process? Can you find the businesses in your community that need the money? or the properties that could be available that may not be as obvious to the private sector ozone investment community. Why? Because they're getting calls from hundreds of counties and cities throughout the country. So they may not know. It is not obvious to them. California is helping. The state has put together a digital marketplace with a company called Opsites that Cosmont works with very closely. This is a place where a county and a city can put every one of its opportunity zone opportunities on a digital website with all the zoning and the processing and points of contact. It makes it easy for the OZ marketplace to get kick-started. Last slide, what's next? What's next is already happening. There's not a day that I go through where I'm not on the phone with a new OZ fund. I was one on the phone in the morning, a couple mornings ago, one who wants to focus on manufactured housing and mobile homes. They're all specialized. They're all asking us at Cosmont, where should we go in California 
to put this money? What makes sense? Because we know the regs are tough, we hear the state's gonna help, but we don't see it yet. So you have, I think, the precipient opportunity to create your perspectives, to figure out your best deals, to get your house in order, and go march out there and see if you can secure some of this money. It's a concerted effort. It can deliver real results. And the more, you, the better and the sooner and the more expansive your initial start is, the greater likelihood for success and the greater capacity you'll have in your community for bringing follow-on investment by adding incentives and really directing where this money is going to go. Is it for everyone? No. Are there flaws? Yes. We talk about gentrification. These districts were based on the 210 census tract. There's studies that say already 18 or 19 percent of the districts had enough investment in them, and those are the ones that the investors want to go to. Why? Because tax yield investors want what? Yield. Our job here, if we're in Fresno, Madera, Stanislaus, wherever we are, is to say no. It does not have to be an LA County investment. You can do forestry, you can do energy, you can do resiliency, you can do infrastructure, you can do mixed use, you can do corridor, commercial corridor improvement, and you should come here and look. Because we want your money and we'll make it work. Here for questions, thanks very much. Thank you, Larry. So our next panelist is Will Oliver. He's with the Fresno PDC, and I think Larry did a great job really framing sort of what the program is and, and the big picture. But now we want to take it a little bit deeper and talk more about Central Valley specific issues. Um, so Will's got a unique lens on Fresno County and how counties and cities are collaborating. He's also going to talk about how he took advantage of something called asset mapping, and then he's going to move into prospectus development, really telling your community story, which is a little bit harder to do. And we want to think about how best to position the Central Valley communities for investment with an eye towards that value creation. So, Will, take it away. Great. Thank you, Erica. Um, again, my name is Will Oliver, Director of Business Services with the Fresno County Economic Development Corporation. I come to this conversation uh, having worn a couple different hats. Uh, one as a recovering politician uh, who was in office and a, a city council uh, in Madera when the OZs came out and we had to work on which census tracts do we include when we get three. And then one as a staff member working for an economic development organization trying to navigate the nuances of OZs as well as some of the uncertainties in determining what is the right fit for our 47 census tracts. And I know that there is a lot of optimism and excitement surrounding this program as there is confusion and unanswered questions. So hopefully we'll be able to provide some uh, takeaways. Um, so I'm gonna provide an overview of our local approach to opportunity zones thus far, a brief overview of some of the core elements found in prospectuses, both that we're working on for our own as well as throughout the United States, uh, some takeaways on how inland and rural California can uh, prioritize and, and, and position themselves for opportunity zone investments, and most importantly, the tools and resources that already exist today so you don't have to go out and reinvent the wheel uh, that you can begin to access. Um, so first, Central Valley Overview, as we all know, uh, we have almost 20% of the Opportunity Zones as census tracts located in the eight county um, uh, Central Valley area here, 21% that are defined rural, 18 that overlap with the new market tax credit program, population around 860,000 people. It also happens to be, according to the Urban Institute, one of the fastest growing areas in the United States with a lot of growth potential. So in Fresno County, from early on, we really benefited uh, working closely with the County of Fresno and Bernard and our respective cities in coordinating comments for which census tracts to include, making sure that we are unified in our support as well as our modifications. Uh, it has allowed us to have 47 census tracts, 10 more than originally designated from the state, uh, and it covers important areas such as census business districts, um, areas that can support housing and commercial development, greenfield development, as well as key transportation corridors such as East Highway 180 and Blackstone Avenue in the city of Fresno. So one of the first things that we've begun doing, um, and this was really the charge of Supervisor uh, Mendez, Maxig, and Supervisor Pacheco, is to start asset mapping. 
and we kicked off over a year ago an opportunity analysis project. Uh, we're soon going to be completing that work, and basically what that's doing is it's looking at key areas along our transportation corridors, such as 99 and 180, looking at underutilized properties, identifying what those assets are, nearby anchor institutions, and what development or infrastructure is required to make them job generating ready, such as the EIFDs and the CREAs, as Larry had mentioned. So we're soon gonna be completing that analysis. It looks at both opportunities on areas as well as other areas that fall outside of the program uh, that are ripe for development potential. In approaching the opportunity zones, I we've you know, looked at prospectuses, you know, where do you start? One of the things that we've done is let's begin identifying who are the potential investors? What are these opportunity funds? It's, it's basically an investment vehicle which is organized as a corporation or partnership to deploy capital to opportunity zone property. As I mentioned, there's over 120 that have been established to date. Uh, what's been reported is about $27 billion worth of uh, capital or, or uh, that can be deployed. So we began looking at who, who's in that space. So we have begun discussions uh, with uh, Opportunity Zone funds that are established, particularly in California, uh, making sure that they're aware of Fresno, aware of our assets, and as well as each of our community's uh, uniqueness. Um, big thing is like, community education and buy-in. Um, as was indicated today, uh, there's still a lot of education and information that's needed beyond this room. There's a whole host of education that is required. And we have a lot of good assets locally, and local capital should not be overlooked. This program is a great outlet for local companies that are looking at expansions, retentions. Maybe it's an off-ramp to dispose of property and an on-ramp to diversify or expand their operation. Um, so that's been a big focus of ours, making sure that we're interacting with our real estate partners, accounting firms like we've been in Hamblick, and our communities, um, and, and providing proper education and outreach. And then lastly, we're putting together a digital perspectives. We just launched an overhaul website for the Fresno EDC. As part of that, it's going to be an add-on just for opportunity zones. Um, we're going to be doing a digital perspectives that's going to rank our assets, allow for potential investors' projects to be able to navigate easily, um, kind of a block-by-block -block, uh, through prime quadrants of the city of Fresno as well as outside surrounding rural communities. So we mentioned prospectuses. Um, I'm going to go over few examples of, of what you find in the core elements. Um, so first, what is that? It's a, it's a user-friendly guide or vehicle that will help cities organize around a unified vision to attract investments and also communicate to investors its assets and growth potential in a way that's palatable. Um, so I'm gonna list some of the core elements that we found through Accelerator for America's uh, examples as well as through other communities. So local community and economic story, taking a deep data dive, complementing capital, inclusive economic development, and project pipeline. <coughs> so first it's important to set the context behind the local community and the economic landscape. What is driving value currently? Identify those key clusters, institutions, and companies that is generating growth. Throughout this document, whether it's a prospectus or a marketing strategy, whatever collateral you're using to promote opportunity zones, you have to highlight where value is created. Because again, this is the greatest benefit for investors. They have to be assured that after 10 plus years, their asset is gonna be appreciating in value and not declining to maximize the benefit. The overview of the city and county landscape. Who is responsible for economic development, opportunity zone leads and projects? What does your local leadership look like? and is it a business-friendly environment? It's important here to list the incentives and resources that are currently available. For the county of Fresno, you know, mentioning that we have a red team to help projects get through the process from A to Z very quickly. Um, or if you have a city that has a money-back guarantee, you wanna mention that too, because investors have to be assured that when they deploy capital, that project can move through the process within that 31 months, which is absolutely key. So taking the data dive into opportunity zones, I don't want to bore you, and at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna have some resources that you can refer to to help you glean a very useful information. So once local background and context has been set, um, your document should try to provide a granular assessment of the strengths or competitive position of each zone or neighborhood or community area. Uh, to that end, if you can provide uh, information on growth dynamics, investment patterns, and again, notable projects that are 
trading value. For example, if you have an OZ zone that's near key infrastructure or an industrial business park or in a city's future planned land use for heavy industrial or high density housing, it's important to note that. Um, and multifamily housing projects or investors who want to know are the market's vacancy rates, cap rates if possible, so as much data it, it, that you can provide um, is very important. Complementing capital and initiatives. Uh, we've all heard the saying, capital follows capital. Um, it's important that counties and cities bring to life existing or planned infrastructure and projects that exist today. I can't understate this. We have access to troves of studies, economic development plans, updated general plans. It's important in picking out some of those nuanced details and spelling that out in your prospectus, your marketing document that says we are prepared, we're ready for your investment, get you through the environmental process, and again, you're going to create your project within 31 months. So if your state community college passed a $500 million bond, you probably want to show them where that West Fresno campus is going to locate. This is going to create value. And again, any other added value that, that you can identify, such as buy right uses, um, areas that you can show projects will be able to navigate quite quickly. So economic inclusivity. So this is the focus of the opportunity zones, is to make an impact in areas that have been distressed and have been lacking investment to create jobs and value. Um, it's important to include this in the revival and it's important to identify the partnerships and programs that are already working to reduce poverty today. Um, I think this is where the counties are uniquely situated. You all are at the forefront of human services, of developing human capital. There are many different examples, many programs in place to help investors answer that question of where their investment in projects can have a direct human impact. So for example, let's say in Fresno County, we have a partnership with the County of Fresno's Department of Social Services. Uh, they work with their welfare work population. We work with businesses, getting them to the table. They get a wage reimbursement to help put those folks into the jobs that they need. In the case of Ulta, if we were to take them, if they were to come in for opportunity zones, those first 50 jobs that Ulta hired was through the county's ready to hire portal. And over 80% came from opportunity zone areas. So we can help capture and quantify the social impact. And I think that is very, very important. So developing project pipeline, as Larry alluded to, it's, it's important to identify projects within the context of land availability, such as site control, zoning, and community needs. It's very important to engage stakeholders internally, like your planning department that can see more start and stops on projects than anyone else, and externally for investment-worthy projects. Um, and then lastly, so that's kind of the core elements that we found in a prospectus document. I think what's most important, it has to be uniquely tailored for your needs. The sooner you can answer the question, what is the need for that particular area or census tract, the easier you can find which is the appropriate opportunity zone fit. So in concluding my remarks, last takeaways for positioning um, the Central Valley in rural California for investment, obviously asset mapping. Clearly spell out zoning and buy right uses as an added value. Show that you can take a project from idea to occupancy within 31, 31 months. A lot of communities, larger metropolitan areas cannot do this or achieve this. Leverage publicly owned property, if you have it, for lease options for opportunity zone projects. As Larry mentioned, the project value is only based on the improvements and not the land. So help take the land acquisition away from that budget pro forma. Focus on the improvements on site by allowing for uh, land lease options and convey available listings and projects through off-sites, other resources, um, to make those readily available for investors. Targeting opportunity funds, go directly to them. Once you have your assets mapped out, you have your request, engage those who are currently in the space. Take inventory of local contractors, builders, developers that could potentially be available for joint venture opportunities. One of the first questions that they may ask is who do we have on the ground that we can work with? that's familiar with the local landscape, that can help us get through the process. And um, of course, mapping and tapping existing resources that exist. So here's a couple resources uh, that I want you to walk away with. So for prospectus examples, you can go to Accelerator for America's website. Again, I can't stress enough, your prospectus or marketing document needs to be tailored to your community's needs. If you're gonna try to replicate what Stockton 
or Memphis is doing, you're going to become very frustrated very quickly. For a directory of opportunity zone funds, you can go to the uh, National Housing uh, Council Agency's website, or you can go to opportunitydb.com. This is a great resource for both existing fund managers that exist, as well as for the conferences that are going to be coming up throughout the remainder of the year. For mapping the metric tools, as we mentioned, there's a big focus on data and these prospectuses and giving investors what it is that they need to see um, in terms of local dynamics in the market. Fortunately, there's a lot of websites and resources that are doing that now at the census tract level in your backyard. Enterprise Opportunities on Explore, they'll generate a report by a census tract. Investreal, this is a company that we're partnering with to get our projects on their database before investors, but they also have indexing of each uh, census tract and a few others there. And of course, as Larry mentioned, offsites.com if not already on it, and Invest for Real if you have any projects. So that concludes my remarks, and I'll be up here for any questions later on the program. Thank you. All right, so you talked a little bit about making sure that the Central Valley's authentic personality and, and the benefits are really highlighted when you're pulling together your perspectives. And the other piece of this is really thinking about how do you make sure that you have positive community from this. And so our next panelist is actually going to talk about that. He's got a little bit more info about some best practices for leveraging um, OZs for economic and social impact. And that's really critical as you think about what are the goals in your region? What are the goals that you want for community and economic development here in your county? So Matt's going to talk about a few things, including the role of philanthropy in directing impact certified funds in underserved communities. And he's going to help make sure that you've got some really good case studies that you can model and best practices of both projects and funding models, because those are all really important for you to know how to get done. Well, thank you. Yes, um, uh, unlike Larry, I might sing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, well, it's great to be here today, and um, uh, I can say, um, and then follow up to, to my fellow panelists here, the, the conversation that the Opportunities Zones has generated uh, since this is adoption around investments that we can direct in place, um, really geared around human capital and, and, and social improvements and resiliency has really, I've, 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 I've never seen such a, such a new renewed interest in, in community development conversations. But, um, and, and to not put Opportunities Zones so much on a pedestal, um, um, we at the Institute have really taken a, a much broader look at, oh, there we go, at um, how do they work as a toolkit um, in, instead of uh, you know, bending ourselves into pretzels to, to mobilize an opportunity zone strategy for, for its own purposes, but how does it fit into our everyday operational strategy around economic development and community development? So um, this is kind of intense, but what we've, what we've tried to do here is establish um, kind of like a deal flow continuum of, of how we think this can best um, live on the public in partnership with the private side uh, and how it all contributes into that capital stack that goes into um, um, local economic development. So how do we align incentives that are geared around the types of infrastructure investments that we want to see, um, housing improvements, workforce housing that we need in our communities, education and upskilling are the, the the talent pool that is in our communities, I think California, um, especially in Southern California, we, we uh, produce or uh, graduate more engineers um, uh, than, than any other place in the country, but we don't employ them. Um, so how do we capture that local human capital element as, as a catalyst for more and robust economic development and regional competitiveness? Um, and then again with the incentives, and not just the, the like, like Buddy was saying, the, 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 the tax incentives, but um, how do we better uh, align or entice local um, business formation or, or business relocation in our areas that can utilize that human capital through our community colleges, our CSUs, and our UCs. Um, the, the red really indicates what Will and, 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 and Larry were talking about, about those barriers, so how do we assess those inhibitors that go into project delays or streamlining efforts that give that value of certainty to development. That's, that's really um, the patient capital aspect, as, as long as they know that the, there's some certainty around these projects uh, from an investor standpoint that, that they will move and, and, and uh, you know, the quote unquote guarantee aspect of, of, of when they can be um, you know, 
uh, great ground, then um, that, that, that adds a little bit more to, um, to making sure that, that we can direct those, those investments where they need to go. Um, and I mean, there's tremendous need across the state, as we all know, um, and from an investment and development standpoint, um, there's any number of millions of housing units we need to see um, uh, across the state, especially in workforce development areas in order to retain some, some um, regional competitiveness and, and cultivate more regional competitiveness. Um, uh, massive improvements, not just in maintenance and, and operation, but in capital development from the infrastructure and resiliency standpoint, energy. And, and water, obviously, as we all know, especially in this region, is key to local and regional competitiveness. Um, Larry touched on a lot of this um, um, already, but um, one thing I will add, you know, there's opportunity zones in every Senate and Assembly District across the state, so um, everybody's got a little bit of skin in this game, and as we've seen that the, the budget trailer bill around conformity makes its way through, um, it's a it's an initial, if not limited, approach to conformity, but it's it's a great start, I think, um, in, in terms of uh, indicating to an investor, a global, not a global, a domestic investor pool, that uh, the California's going to be competitive here, or at least make some efforts to be competitive here. Um, uh, and and what we've done at the institute is is really a multi-layered um, uh, state framework approach, but around the policy framework. That's not just at the state from Sacramento down up, but a local grassroots. Um, um, and, and Will really touched a lot on this, um, especially from, cap, from a capacity building standpoint and an asset mapping right there that I think is, is established there in that, that top toolbox, um, all the way down to identifying the, the local um, project inhibitors that, that we saw in that red box earlier. Um, but this insulate um, local deal flow aspect of about four down there is, is I think, really indicative of what um, of, of, of what Larry was saying earlier around some of the lessons that we learned from redevelopment where we're insulating risk capital. Right, what we're doing here essentially is insulating patient capital. Um, um, then you know, aligning uh, from an operational standpoint the, the financial toolkits and local incentives that can help and support broader. Um, and, and more robust economic community development. And then, you know, some type of call for projects, um, maybe that's not, um, lives at the beginning or at the end, but um, that there's, uh, at least from a state standpoint, maybe we could see like a fund that has um, some call for projects or technical assistance component to it to help uh, further support um, the, the resources at a local level in terms of prospectus building and, and, and of the sort. Um, here we'll just touch a bit on what we think um, in terms of, uh, from a regional standpoint, local standpoint, what, what um, some of the key players that, that may have already been mentioned, but some that we think um, are, are, are needed in that space is, especially on the, the philanthropic side, um, uh, especially geared towards human capital development and upskilling programs in collaboration with, with um, employers. Um, that's really key towards <coughs> this regional competitiveness aspect that we're trying to enhance, as well as, um, and maybe my time at SCAG may be a little biased, but the untapped potential at the MPOs, as I think that we'll see the Metropolitan Planning Organizations, um, uh, really have um, uh, not just the data tools, but from an outreach and, and um, uh, project perspectives, um, already touch on, I think, as you will see, a lot of what we're hoping from an um, aspirational standpoint, from a development standpoint that we want to see in, in and around our communities. Um, uh, and we're not the only ones that are talking about philanthropy. Uh, Bruce Katz, who's with Accelerator for America and, and formerly with HUD, and uh, Brookings Institute talks a lot about what will, and this is just, I think, just to reinforce the engagement and enhancing that local control aspect around what you want to see in your in, your, in the communities from a development aspect, express development aspect. Um, philanthropy is really key in doing that. I think you can see that leadership already emerging from the Central Valley Community Foundation, Ask Square Energy is doing a lot of that work. Um, and um, all around the, the region, you have players that are, I think, um, really positioned well to, to play that role in, in drawing out value and, 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 and investable um, potential. Um, and, and perhaps one of California's greatest public um, assets is its education institutions. 
Um, it's, it's really a key element in our famous uh, economic innovation economy that we have. Um, we can see from a tech transfer standpoint, um, uh, there's obvious room for, for growth in the Central Valley, um, utilizing our key institutions like UC said, Fresno State, Stanislaus. So um, trying to see how they're connected to local startups, how we can cultivate regional growth through business development, entrepreneurship there, um, around key industries like advanced manufacturing, um, aerospace, genomics, and bioscience. Um, all of these are, as we'll see, kind of the, the key growth industries around the state, and California's uniquely positioned to, to leverage that for, for more robust development. Um, lots of room to grow, um, and especially regionally here, um, uh, how do we cultivate more hardware engineers and software developers and, and bioscience scientists? Um, these all things from an upskilling standpoint, engagement with employers and philanthropy. Um, as we're talking about the future of work and getting away from you know, the specter or the anxiety around job displacement, but what can we do as a community to get more um, students involved from an access standpoint to the types of skills they need to be competitive? Um, just to reinforce the, 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 the real um, trend lines around um, um, uh, uh, high quality job growth and where some of those opportunities lie around the state, um, especially coming out of the recession, um, with a big disparity in terms of um, high quality jobs versus low skill, low paying jobs. Um, and that's just not um, in the Central Valley, but um, um, LA is, 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 is really um, struggling with that as well. Um, and as we look towards others to see you know, who's doing what in this spectrum, that three-legged stool really of the development side of, of opportunity zones and community development, the jobs, business formation, location, infrastructure, and housing, um, uh, cities uh, across the state really with, without a, a lot of um, um, support in, in terms of capacity building or technical assistance or, or even existing state funds or policy are really doing a lot of what Will and, and, and Larry have already talked about. They're measuring assets, they're trying to see how they're connected to the global supply chain, they're drawing out the values locally and, and expressing those in their prospectus around assets and, and, and investable potential. Um, in, in Riverside, we see a lot of the, the programs aligned with um, the ecosystem and the UC and the UC Riverside there and building out more innovation districts and, and business locations. Um, Stockton, as we all know, is, is, is utilizing a prospectus to do um, real similar revitalization efforts um, um, that, that, that are kind of full spectrum um, development opportunities there. Um, who's from Santa Rosa? And anyone from Santa Rosa in the room? Um, I think you should be really proud because this isn't an expressed opportunity zone um, strategy, but what Santa Rosa has done is, is if we remember that all the way back to that red box in the slide, is taking a look at at least the, the, the housing action plan is, is trying to take a look at how they can better streamline and, 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 and promote more uh, uh, accelerated housing development. It's, it's a strategy that could be scaled around the state, I think, and it should a real good sign of local leadership there. Um, so kind of back to that MPO uh, element that I uh, mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, I think we're doing a lot of this work already and it's expressed in state statute and the kind of activities from a regional planning standpoint that we're already engaged, especially in the SCS. So um, one of the things I noticed in, in prep for this session was um, the, the Fresno COG um, uh, last updated SCS, um, if, if you read it, reads a lot like um, what could be potential aspirational goals for, for um, an OZ investment strategy, um, whether that's um, adopted smart growth principle number eight around providing a variety of transportation choices or mixed use, um, a preference and prioritization of, mi of mixed use um, of development. Um, um, even uh, number 10, you know, the, the taking advantage of compact building design, there's some value capture elements there that, that we can use to further incentivize and attract development. Um, um, and I think that once we understand and unlock the potential of of, of the activity that we're already engaged in and, and really make those synergies between our planning and our, uh, and our development goals, um, I think we can, we can better streamline the process and, and make it more of a, a function of our, of our um, current 
bureaucratic and, and, and political alignments. Um, and just, to, you know, I know that, that there's some conversation at the state around um, what uh, uh, a treasurer's office fund all around opportunity zones, or as, as Larry mentioned, SB5, um, a, a state housing or, or infill fund. Um, a, a other states, uh, just an example here, this is by no means um, you know, an exhaustive list, but just a, a quick snapshot of what we think uh, state funds could be prioritized around to do in order to mitigate certain risk, um, whether it's you know, brownfield mitigation, uh, so recapitalization of, of the state's um, um, cow reuse um, uh, infill development tool is something to think about here, um, and also other uh, community funds. I know we have, um, uh, what is that, the, uh, the California, um, I'm, I'm misremembering the, uh, the tax credit there, but it's a California, California for Peace, that's exactly right. But that's kind of indicative of the building communities funds or even the, the opportunities funds you see there in Nevada. So um, with that, I think I'll, um, I'll, I'll conclude these comments and, and be ready for questions. But um, thanks again for having me here, and I really appreciate the time to talk with you. Thank you. Okay, so let's regroup for a second and think about what we've heard. So we've heard Larry talk basics and really talk about why we need to do this. Why do we need to think about it? Why do you need to figure out if this is something that can work in your county? And then we'll talk about how Fresno County is specifically working um, to, to, to market the community to investors. And then Matt gave us kind of a high level. He talked about what's happening at the state level, what's happening at the national level, and what are some of the specific things that he's seeing happen and being done well in other places, and the trends we're seeing, whether it's related to jobs, whether it's related to industry, technology, education, what are the linkages, right, with all of the ways that you could talk about this. Um, and what I've heard is that there's a lot of opportunity for you to do things very differently than what's happening in terms of the best practices and case studies that you've seen. There's also some similarities and some things that I think um, we know are opportunities for us. The key thing is here, this could be a really incredible opportunity for county leaders to work with other jurisdictions, and you can work with investors and developers and the social sector to impact change in your community. And the key thing is here, if your discussions are already happening and you're not in the room, you should join those conversations because I know that the cities are working pretty actively to, to, to capitalize on this program, and there should be a county voice involved in that as well. Some other key points are that you have an important role to play. Time is pretty short, about six months to really get everything together. And then think more about collaboration than competition. And, and really, as you're going through this process, know and understand your community, understand your value, understand the unique assets that you have, and the goals that you have. Not just the developer goals, but what your goals are. Um, and advance your regional priorities with this program if you can. And then there are lots of state and national resources. There are best practices that you can model. Um, and you think about it, like we just talked about, this is not just about real estate. It can also be about business. It can be about infrastructure. You know, there's a lot of need in the Central Valley, and this program can help fund some of the support needed for that. And then if you think about social impact, also think about wealth creation. Um, and then from a financing standpoint, again, we, we don't have an official tax account, though I think Larry doubled his that today. You can layer incentives, you can layer financing tools, and you can really maximize this benefit. Here's a few steps to get started. Um, big one, collaboration. If you do nothing with Opportunity Zones, having a conversation with city, county, municipal, civic, and other leaders, community-based organizations about regional priorities, that's huge. So if that hasn't happened yet, it could happen through this discussion, and you can make a really deliberate and conscious decision to participate or not in this program. Um, and then if you can identify projects, help them move along, explore financing, and then refine your value proposition and market your community. You've got resources online, um, on the ILG page, and then also with the CSAC page, and then this is a double up of, the, of what we'll pull together on the resources, which are all available electronically. Um, we did want to make sure that you were aware of the program before it, uh, the timing is, is kind of uh, beyond us, and, and we want to make sure that um, you know that we're here as a resource to you, both at ILG and CSAC, and thank you so much for the opportunity to talk and to you about just this. just one thing. We, I brought some of these. This is an EIFD and an Opportunity Zone Manual. We have it electronically. If you give me a card, I'll get it to you. It's too heavy to bring a lot of. They're also a resource, but I've got about six here, and if you give me a card, I'll send it to you, okay? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you all so much, and here's our contact information.